Now, let's talk about this building works agency that you're proposing. Uh, tell us why you think this would be make a difference and, and who would be held accountable? Well, as you, as you know, Caroline, from some of the excellent coverage that you've done in the Sunday Times, we've got hundreds of thousands of innocent homeowners now trapped in unsellable, unmortgageable, um, uninsurable uh, homes. And frankly, the government's response so far has really been marked by indifference, inertia and beset by spiralling um, costs and, and the fund that they've set aside really isn't working and, and the money is, is not being allocated uh, quickly enough. So that's why we really think there needs to be a different approach now. And as you say, we're proposing a building works agency, which be, which would be a government appointed uh, crack team, we're calling it, of experts um, who would um, go building to building to risk assess, fund, fix and certify and then recover um, the funds uh, ultimately from from those responsible so that every building affected can actually get through this uh, system quickly and um, that leaseholders are not the ones uh, who are left living in this waking uh, nightmare that they are at the moment and it really does need that kind of strong leadership and intervention that we have not seen so far it can't just be left to the private sector with a sort of fund that is quite um, difficult to access and is, is, is not being actioned quickly enough. Isn't the truth really that actually the only thing that's going to make a difference here is if the government stump up a vast sum of cash in effect to actually solve this problem and until that happens very little is going to change. It's already been four years since Grenfell. Well it has already been four years and, and the problems are getting worse as you've covered in the, in the paper this morning and in previous uh, weeks. These the, the so-called remediation works that, that buildings are now being deemed to, to, to need doing are ever growing. They go way beyond uh, simply dangerous cladding. They, they're going to all sorts of, of issues. And so unless the government get a grip of this, it is not going to be uh, sorted out. And actually, they have set aside quite a reasonable pot of money. I mean, it might not be big enough. We, we don't know yet. But let's make sure that that £5 billion that they set aside actually has effect and does deliver what it needs to deliver, which is freeing all these hundreds of thousands of innocent homeowners from this nightmare that they are in, because it is utterly heartbreaking. It's breaking up marriages. It's, it's making people bankrupt. It's causing people untold mental stress and anxiety. It, it's having a terrible toll on people who are now finding that they've got uh, valueless uh, properties and there's no end in sight so it really does need a lot of leadership and intervention and I think there is you know a good decent pot of money there to start off with at least anyway um, that we could get through the system more quickly and and relieve this problem from from many. We all remember those tragic images uh, when Grenfell, the Grenfell Tower happened and 72 people sadly lost their lives. Why do you think it's taken so long for a, the government to get a grip of this? You know, is there a sense, do you think, of neglect and mismanagement there? I, I do, I'm afraid. I mean, I think they say the right things and I think they sort of want to, to help, but they're taking the wrong approach. They're effectively leaving it up to the same people who got us in this mess in the first place, the developers, the uh, landowners, the, the, the freeholders, um, the managing agents, and all of those people who got us into this mess in the first place, they're leaving it to them to sort out. Yeah, they're stumping up a bit of money, but they're effectively leave, leaving it to the same broken, failed private sector first approach um, to sort this out. And, and that's not working and it's not going to work. And actually, many Conservative MPs have come to the same conclusion as, as, as I have. Um, you know, one leading Tory backbench at Venture who's been campaigning on this issue, who's not one of the sort of usual suspect rebels, you know, has called this shocking incompetence and a, and a massive betrayal. And, and that's what it is. So, yeah, the, the government have, have been left wanting on this. They've been dragging their feet. It's taken too long um, to, to, to get anywhere near where we need to get to. And now it's being beset by spiralling costs. So unless they get a grip of this, this is just never going to end. 
Just moving on, I mean, it'd be negligent not to talk about the big story of the day uh, here. I mean, obviously, you think it was right for Matt Hancock to resign over his breach of social distancing rules. But do you really think it's in the best interest of the country to change the health secretary at this pivotal moment in the pandemic? Well, yes, I do. He needed to go. Uh, he should have gone on Friday. He should have been sacked by the prime minister. And I think it speaks to uh, the prime minister's really, uh, frankly, I think poor judgment in not coming to that decision straight away, um, which he should have done. These are the difficult tasks of leadership. And he, he does have this worryingly dangerous blind spot when it comes to issues of integrity and con conduct in uh, public life. But, uh, you know, underpinning that, I do think there was a bit of arrogance here that somehow only Matt Hancock could lead the health department at, at this difficult time. Um, that's not the case. There are many able people that could um, do, do this job at this point in time. And it would have been irresponsible not to have moved him because when you're talking about public health and public health messages, which are so critical to dealing with this pandemic, you had a guy in, in Matt Hancock as the, as the health secretary um, who no one was going to listen to anymore and take seriously and no one was going to follow what he was asking them because he himself had had found to, to broke the rules and, and wasn't taking responsibility for that. So I think it would have been irresponsible to have left him in position, actually. It was Barnard Castle all over again, wasn't it? I mean, on the basis that, you know, people are looking at the sort of figures in government who are telling us all what to do, telling us not to love our love, uh, hug our loved ones, telling us not to put our relationships on hold. I mean, do you think that is what voters are really concerned about? It's not that he was having an affair. It's that he broke the rules that he himself set. Absolutely. I mean, of course, I don't really care whether he's having an affair or or what, that's not an interest to, to me, and I'm sure it's not of interest to most uh, of the public either. But the fact was, at the time of this video and of, of this uh, affair that was taking place, and it was taking place while he was on the job. So, you know, he was on the job while he was on the job, so to speak. Uh, so it was on taxpayers' time that this was, was happening. At the time, we were all told that we could only have close contact with those who we were in a bubble with. And it turned out that Matt Hancock was actually in two bubbles and he was breaking the very rules that he set. And, and so therefore he instantly uh, becomes a message carrier that is no longer able to deliver and carry those messages. You cannot have the rule maker being the rule breaker and, that, and thinking that you can carry on uh, as normal. And, and that's even before we get to the issues around public appointments and, and whether it's appropriate that a, a, a close friend, so to speak, um, can, can be appointed to positions being paid for by, by us through our taxes.